Hello everyone. This is the second lecture for the compress sensing uh, following the um, main lecture of uh, cooperative communication networks of the Deutsche Telekom Chair of uh, Communication Networks. I am Marwa Teuti. I already recorded lecture one uh, regarding uh, compressed sensing. So please, those who haven't um, checked it yet, please go there first and then come uh, because this is a follow-up lecture. And uh, I hope you will enjoy uh, what is coming uh, forward. Okay, so I would like to start first like with an outline. First of all, I will be briefly talking about a takeaway from the first lecture, what we would like to remember, like the essence of the first lecture. Then I would be um, going to uh, discuss the null space property for the measurement matrices as, long, as, well, as well as the uh, definition of uh, Spark. And then we go for the applications uh, that are meant for compressed sensing. And then we will talk about distributed compressed sensing. And then I will make a small, um, maybe deviate a little bit from the lecture to remind people of what network coding is with some uh, a small, very basic example about network coding. And then I will be finishing the lecture uh, by discussing uh, some uh, research results that I uh, personally, along with some other colleagues from the chair, have achieved regarding compressed sensing and network coding combinations. So I would like to start with the takeaway from lecture one. Remember, in the previous lecture, we talked about how to formulate a problem, uh, a compressed sensing problem. For that, we need a sparse signal X um, that we are going to uh, uh, project randomly over a, a sensing matrix or measurement matrix A to obtain a, a very, very small signal Y. Um, like the dimension of Y is uh, um, small compared to X. So the first thing that uh, we should remember is that it has to be a sparse signal. Then somebody would ask, what if I don't have a sparse signal? Okay, there is actually absolutely no problem. You just need to find a sparse representation in a different transform. Remember, we have seen how to um, uh, project the signals into different bases. For example, we used a DCT or a Fourier transform to obtain uh, sparse signals. So then the question that uh, can somebody arise is, what if the, the existing transform cannot actually give me a sparse signal? Also here, the problem is already solved for non free existing transform we actually uh, can simply train an over complete dictionary and uh, we will see in detail how we will perform this and how we obtain a, a, an over complete dictionary and uh, the third question regarding sparsity uh, someone would ask is simply what if my signal that i am obtaining at the end is not exactly sparse so we know that the, for example, physical signals, uh, for instance, uh, temperature or humidity, uh, they could be compressible signal as well. And it has been proved that uh, compressible signals work, uh, work uh, um, let's say, as fine as uh, sparse signals with a minor uh, error, but it is not harmful for the problem of compressed sensing. And just keep in mind that we actually live in a world that is compressible. Whatever you see around uh, from signals, data, whatsoever, if we um, intelligently play around with, we will obtain something that is either sparse or compressible. Also remember that A, the sensing matrix, should obey one of the common properties. For example, the restricted isometric property or restricted eigenvalue or the null space property that we will see just in the next slide and finally um, someone would say yeah but we already discussed that uh, these uh, properties uh, if we want to try 
they will be kind of like NP hard problems that I would like to remind everyone that the problem could be solved by simply using a Gaussian or a Bernoulli uh, matrix. These kind of random matrices work well and the problem here is solved. So third point, please do not forget that your um, measurements, the size of Y should be uh, very small compared to the original signal. So here we have the number of measurement M is far fewer than the uh, signal dimension N. And last, uh, your um, a sparsity K should be also lower than the uh, measurement size. So if someone understands well these uh, four uh, points, then I think the problem of compressed sensing is no longer a problem and uh, you can easily um, play around to observe some very good results. Okay, so let me start first with explaining the null step property, which is also like, kind of like uh, similar to the uh, RIP, but it differs in the sense that uh, like each of, uh, of these properties, they tackle a different uh, problem or they see the problem from a different angle. So here, the null space property, it only gives me a necessary and sufficient conditions on the reconstruction of my sparse signals with just the L1 relaxation. So there is this uh, main theorem uh, for null space property. And we can actually uh, confirm that a matrix A has a null space property of all the K, where K is here the sparsity. If I'm having a certain uh, vector, uh, this epsilon t, um, like the norm uh, L1 of my uh, epsilon t vector should be uh, smaller than its complement. And um, of course here the epsilon t is actually the vector that contains the, um, the coordinates of epsilon on t and uh, epsilon tc is actually the complement. And, and this is like uh, for all epsilons that are um, included or that are actually uh, in the kernel of uh, uh, A, my matrix A, and um, like with removing the null vector. Of course, here uh, the cardinal of T has to be smaller than the sparsity. And this is um, kind of like sufficient uh, to certify the uh, use of, a, of the matrix A. So along there is a second theorem that is also important. So given that we have a matrix A, the one that we were talking about, and uh, the certain sparsity that could vary from 1 to n, for every k sparse vector that we have x of size n, is actually the unique solution of the optimization problem. And this is uh, if and only if A has the null space property of all the K. So for example, if I'm trying to solve the kernel of A, for uh, this AX equals zero, then I should obtain only one solution, a unique solution. There is no way that I could obtain, for example, AX1, equals AX2. This would simply give me uh, like a, um, an, uh, an unlimited number of solutions. And then we will go back to the first uh, a problem uh, related to the um, linear algebra in general. So, so someone has to be really careful and pay attention to the first thing uh, about this. However, there is an issue as well within this uh, null space property. There is a difficulty to verify um, uh, to verify this property due to its generally high computational complexity. So here we are always falling into the same problem, regardless the property that we are having. We always have a problem of checking the matrix uh, by, via uh, checking their null space property or the restricted eigenvalue uh, or the rate property. However, 
uh, the null space property could be a very good uh, use if we are trying to perform compressed sensing in a finite field. Because, you know, finite field, we cannot uh, employ uh, these kind of projections and we are playing around with a finite field rather than real values. And here, with the null space property, we don't really sense the presence of this, uh, uh, like, a, a close to orthogonality or some real values and so on. So if you are really interested in finite field, um, it will be interesting if you use the null space property. Another thing is the spark, which is the smallest number k, such that there exists a set of k columns within my matrix A that are linearly dependent. So the spark A is by definition the like a minimum um, D, like the, the support of D subject to AD equals zero. Here is a, somehow related to the uh, the kernel, as we see, AD equals zero. But please remember that in contrast to the spark, which takes me to check in the columns that are linearly dependent, they are finding the uh, like the smallest uh, set of uh, or number of columns here. Remember that we, uh, like in contrast, the rank is actually the largest number k, such that a set of k columns is linearly independent. So try to uh, be careful uh, about this. I will pay attention on the exercises. I will explain this a little bit further with some uh, examples. And to enable an ambiguous reconstruction of k-sparse vectors, actually the spark is, is very useful. So we have here a necessary and sufficient uh, condition if my if the spark of my matrix A is uh, a larger or equal than 2k this is actually equivalent to heaven for all uh, measurements in uh, the real field uh, like RM there exists at most one x uh, with the support of x is smaller uh, or equal to k of course subject to our uh, uh, equations that we've been discussing. And this applies that uh, M should be actually uh, larger or equal to 2K. So actually there are more results that uh, show, um, how to say, that actually do not uh, impose that M should be equal uh, or larger to 2K, but rather a little bit closer but uh, the spark needs, um, let's say, a little bit of freedom. It needs a little bit of insurance, uh, as well as the null space property. They need a little bit of insurance uh, to um, certify the, whether a, a, a sense and matrix is suitable or not. Again, we have to remember that the computing the spark of a matrix is as well empty hard. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit tough. You have to really... Uh, uh, check with combinatorics which columns are dependent or not, and so on. So now we go to uh, understanding these uh, dictionaries that we mentioned before that actually come uh, to replace the well-known uh, transform. And uh, by definition, the dictionary is a matrix that is a collection of elementary atoms. Remember that atoms are actually columns, but the field of compressed sensing and some other signal processing or, or, or uh, sparse representation, uh, we prefer to use atoms. And these atoms are represented as D and uh, the set of these columns from uh, D1 to DL, where each of these small D have the size N. And uh, yeah, when they are actually called dictionary atoms or basis functions. So based on the number of atoms here L and the signal length N, the dictionary D could be classified based on three categories, which is also similar to uh, linear system of equations. So it is called overcomplete, 
This means that it contains some redundancy. Uh, if L is uh, superior than N, it's called undercomplete dictionary when L is smaller than N. And here we fall back into the first problem that we discussed with the linear algebra or complete if exactly we have L equals N. But in this lecture or in compressed sensing in general, we focus usually on overcomplete because they are robust, they are actually less sensitive to noise and other form of degradation, and they are flexible in matching the generative model to the input structure. So for an overcomplete dictionary learning, the goal is we want to find a linear combination of a few, few, here we bring sparsity, atoms from D that is close to the original signal X. This means that I would like to have a very low reconstruction error. Remember, remember that D should be chosen such that it sparsifies the representation, otherwise what is the point of this dictionary? If I'm not going to sparsify my data, then it goes to garbage. It's pointless. Second of all, uh, also, you could uh, maybe have a flashback over the last uh, lecture. You can actually also use these predefined dictionaries or frames. We have different names, but uh, overall it's the same. The predefined dictionaries from a very well-known set of transforms, like we discussed DCT, wavelet, curvelet, bandless. There are a lot. I personally do not even uh, know much of them. And but here the difference is that a learned dictionary can lead to state-of-the-art performance for numerous tasks. Okay, so again, we would like to uh, understand a little bit how. Uh, we can find the best over complete dictionary uh, using a set of training samples X and the sparsest representation uh, uh, that we can obtain is uh, expressed as a minimum support of X. Remember that X are actually um, a set of signals. Unlike the compressed sensing here, we are using multiple signals. So if you want to relate to what we've seen, what we've seen before, we had before only the small x, for example, this one, but here we have a set or a collection of these x's. So this x, capital X, is uh, like a matrix of, uh, of my signals. So we would like to minimize the support of x subject to y equals dx. It could be written differently, similarly to the compressed sensing problem. We would like to minimize the support of x subject to y minus dx in the, using the L2 norm is actually uh, very minimal. So we have a small error. And this could be done using a two procedure, uh, a two stage procedure. First stage, we need to uh, perform what we call a sparse coding a stage. First of all, like the first step would be to fix the dictionary D or like initialize the dictionary D and we are trying to find this sparse X. And the second would be to update the dictionary based on the results that we would get. And of course, the first few rounds, we cannot really obtain a dictionary alongside with the, um, with the sparse uh, uh, vector. So we have to reiterate again and perform one stage of uh, sparse coding. Uh, of course, the, here we do not initialize the, um, the dictionary, but we use what we obtained with the previous uh, iteration. And we keep going until uh, we converge to uh, obtaining a sparsest representation along with uh, a dictionary. So how it actually works. So here, instead of uh, put in mind that instead of having one signal, as we previously seen in the compressed sensing lecture, one, 
we have multiple signals. Like uh, you could see that uh, I put some, um, it looks like some straps, uh, each of which represent uh, one signal. So each one of them is actually a column. For example, each column is a set of sensor readings, let's say temperature in an interval of n time slots. So, and here we have an unknown dictionary that we are going to try. Well, um, uh, sorry, not unknown, like something that we are uh, initializing, but the, the result we don't know yet. So here, we, we are going to initialize the uh, dictionary that we are going to try for all these signals. And then each of these original signals will obtain its sparse representation in X here. So the first signal here would obtain its sparse representation in the first column here. And the goal, remember, is to design the dictionary, the very good dictionary for our uh, problem. And we basically, uh, along with that, we basically want a sparse representation for all the signals. So what we are doing is that trying to find Z and X by summing over P, this means that all the signals that we have, we are summing over all the signals that we have, and we have one dictionary for all the signals. This one is the common for all the signals that we have, and we want a sparse representation for each one, from the first to the fifth column. So all in all, they have to have a very good representation, and they have to be sparse at the same time. As a matter of fact, as the number of signals increase, for example, it becomes, um, I don't know, P becomes something like extremely immensely huge, it might become a little bit tricky to work on this optimization problem. We have a pro like a huge memory uh, consumption, but, uh, it is uh, uh, nice to point out that it exists, what we uh, so-call an online dictionary learning, which could easily take an immense number of signals without uh, having a computational uh, a problem. So this means that we are going to learn and adapt the dictionary, let's say on the fly, as the signals keep coming. So we don't have to have a huge memory to save all the data. But this is maybe for the curious one who would like to see it, but it also exists like the, the algorithms you can uh, check online. And um, before, in, before moving forward, it would be nice uh, that everybody uh, check the dimensions of uh, each of the uh, data. So here, my original data set or my uh, uh, like the collection of uh, signals or sensor readings that I have are of size n p, which is equal to here we have a dictionary n l and the sparse representation l p with a little bit of uh, like a step uh, of a matrix calculation. We uh, easily verify the, the the matching dimensionality between. Um, the first half of the equation and the second half. Okay. So since the dawn of compressed sensing, there has been a set of uh, common dictionary learning algorithms. Um, maybe even before, I, I do not know, but they are like I summed all, most of the well-known algorithms that are based on the generalization of the k-mean algorithms. All of these, they use the k-mean algorithms, but each of them has, of course, a specific difference. Um, there are the method for, uh, of optimal directions, uh, maximum a posteriori probability approach, uh, there is the union of orthonormal bases, maximum likelihood methods, uh, KSVD, and um, last, maybe this is one of the latest uh, 
algorithms that are provided, which is the simultaneous code word optimization. Um, but there is um, like everybody likes to use KSVD. It's like easy to understand. It doesn't require a lot of, uh, let's say, mathematical background to understand it. And it has um, gained a lot of interest. And most of the works, they keep uh, referring to the, uh, the first paper that uh, proposes it. So that's why I, I personally prefer to uh, work using KSVD and most of my work have been uh, uh, run using uh, this specific algorithm. So just to have an overview and for those who are interested in going into details and understanding how this algorithm actually works, um, you could refer to the paper or simply go to understand like um, maybe a, let's say a digest about this algorithm in the Comnets book, in the Compress Sensor Lecture, uh, to see uh, a little bit more of the, de de the details. But here I uh, just uh, uh, propose an overview or a general idea about it. So first of all, you need a really a set of data. You, know, you cannot create a dictionary just by having one vector and like, hello, I, I want to have a dictionary. A dictionary of what? You don't even know anything about this data. You need a set of uh, examples or, or uh, signals that you need to uh, inspect and learn and uh, ad so that you could adapt your uh, dictionary based on it. You cannot create it with one, uh, with one uh, vector, that's all. So, it's a, as I said, it's a, a k-means clustering algorithm generalization. It uses the singular value decomposition, something that we all seen before in uh, linear algebra, algebra classes. And the OMP algorithm that I explained in the previous lecture, I even gave an example how to compute if I'm having a very tiny small uh, signal. So remember, KSVD algorithm, uses k-mean clustering, SVD and OMP algorithm, and it actually alternates between fine and sparse approximation of the training vectors and iteratively updating the columns to better fit the data. So there is also this small um, um, graph that uh, shows the steps. So first of all, let's initialize our dictionary D, move to my sparse coding, of course, uh, the sparse coding requires an, uh, one of these reconstruction algorithms for compressed sensing, but the best would be some kind of match and pursuit. And the best, according to my, my experience, is the OMP. And based on this, we move to the next step of uh, dictionary update. Uh, this is done column by column uh, by SVD computation of the relevant example. And we keep uh, like reiterating until we obtain the uh, dictionary D or uh, and the sparse representation. So as for the performance of this algorithm, I um, I uh, copied the example provided uh, in the first paper uh, regarding KSVD and uh, in their performance they were having these uh, synthetic results. So for each of the tested, al tested algorithms that I explained, uh, or at, at least mentioned uh, previously, they were having a, a, a comparison between, uh, between them. And um, so for each of these tested algorithms and for each of the noise level that we have, they have, uh, they have had 50 trials and the results they were sorted so here we have the like the number of trials 50 times and here is the you could see like here there is no noise and here like the level of noise changes and the graph labels uh, they uh, actually represent this uh, mean number of detected atoms so here we have the mean values of these detected uh, atoms or columns out of 50 trials or the order test in groups of 10 experiments. So it's very clear that uh, to notice that the KSVD 
mostly succeeds in, uh, in most of the cases. There is the 50 trials. We are mostly succeeding in obtaining the dictionary, the sparse representation and everything. And it actually outperforms uh, this uh, maximum a posteriori based algorithm or the MOD algorithm as well. So it shows very good performance overall compared to the state of the art uh, dictionary, over complete dictionary algorithms. Also, um, from the same uh, paper, we found um, like uh, something that we could uh, visibly uh, see. So here we have uh, two sets of uh, images. We have a corrupted uh, image uh, placed here to the left with the missing pixels that are uh, marked as points and the rec reconstructed result by the learned dictionary. So here we have different, uh, different dictionary. You could see we have the learned dictionary like that you train, or you have the hard dictionary, or you have the uh, DCT uh, uh, dictionary. So if I'm having 50% of my pixels missing, then uh, my uh, learned dictionary, you could see that it gives me a clearer uh, uh, visibility to the original picture. And actually, it requires an average, uh, let's say, 4.02 coefficients compared to 4.7, here also 4.7. Uh, with other uh, dictionaries or uh, predefined dictionaries and also the reconstruction uh, uh, error is uh, kind of like small compared to the other ones as well as when we have 70 percent of the pixels missing, the, our learned dictionary obtained using the KSVD still gives a very better performance compared with the other uh, two examples. And uh, surprisingly, it uses also a very low number of uh, coefficients in average here because we have uh, less uh, pixels or we have less data uh, to work with. So we have uh, in average less coefficients. So now we move to understanding the compressed sensing applications, which is a very, very vast topic that it's a bit tough to just go search in the internet, okay, what are the compressed sensing applications from my personal uh, experience? I think that compressed sensing is something like a joker that you could stick it anywhere as long as you have data uh, that fulfills Let's say the, uh, the first slide that I uh, put my recap there, then wow, I, I can have compressed sensing. So it's so just like a plugin with every uh, application that I have. If I sense a bit of data lying around, then okay, I can use my compressed sensing. But here I'm just trying to, um, how to say, give some of them. Uh, at least the ones that I, I find uh, interesting to uh, uh, learn about, and, and, and that's all. So uh, first, I would like to uh, discuss some of the compressed sensing advantages. And uh, it's very cool to know, as I've been always pointing, it's actually uh, universal. Some random projections or hardware can be used for any compressible signal class. And it is generic and future proof. Uh, you can try any different uh, type of signal models, different bases, statistical models whatsoever. And um, it will always work. I mean, it's, it's magically nice. But of course, there is no magic here. It's also democratic, which is interesting if I'm having losses within my transmissions or I'm having some kind of uh, like uh, problems uh, that uh, would put one measurement uh, with a privilege compared with the other. Here, it's a democracy 
is uh, uh, noticed in the sense that each measurement carries the same amount of information. And it has a very, very simple encoding. Even these uh, very uh, fragile sensors that are thrown in the forest, they can actually perform uh, compressed sensing. It doesn't require a lot of energy consumption to do it. It's just a normal projection, and that's it. And it's also a robust to measurement losses or quantization um, because of this uh, uh, real value uh, um, multiplication or a rounding up. It's also asymmetrical. Most of the processing is done at the decoder. So I can shift most of my work to the decoder. Of course, my decoder would be a very powerful machine or a um, well, I do not know what type of applications, but it, in, in some of these uh, applications, we leave most of the work to the decoder. So we, we just want to send, keep sending uh, whatever we have in a compressed fashion to reduce the number of transmissions, to, to, to reduce the energy consumption and so on and so forth. And most of the job is done at the decoder. And last, random projections, they are uh, actually weakly constructed. So for the applications, um, we have, for example, technological applications, including signal pixel camera, medical imaging, like the ECG, MRI, anything related to uh, uh, medical imaging, uh, also a radar. It's also uh, very, uh, very used in, uh, for scientific motivations, let's say, or uh, like uh, research uh, areas, like sampling theory, sparse approximation, as well as error, error correction and machine learning. Um, and I mean, it's, it's not the only examples, the applications, but I'm just given an overall uh, areas of, uh, of applicability of compressed sensing. I would like to finish by um, mentioning the theoretical extensions of low rank recovery or uh, matrix completion. Uh, for example, for matrix completion, if we have, uh, um, let's take the example of Netflix where everybody puts his uh, uh, ranking regarding some movie, but some of the customers, they don't. So here comes the, the field of matrix completion to uh, kind of like provide a, a, a guessing or uh, try to um, fill in these uh, empty uh, spots from the subscribers who haven't uh, set the ranking yet. Another important thing, uh, of course, now we are witnessing uh, or like we are living in the in the launch of the 5G uh, standard in 2020, and we know that uh, everybody is working hard for the industry 4.0. Everything is um, moved um, from uh, human to uh, robots, and uh, most of the factories are actually um, like working on, on on getting these robot arms. Uh, to do most of the job, especially if we have uh, situations where uh, a human could be put in danger, for example, if there are like a certain level of heat or a, a small space or like there is a sufficiently uh, large number of applications. But uh, here, like all, if you see within the image, we have uh, all these machines or uh, IoT devices uh, they are uh, instantly um, sensing the environment, since, uh, inst um, uh, sorry, instantly uh, having uh, some calculations uh, to, uh, to deliver or some acceleration level and so on. And uh, here, due to this big uh, image, with the correlation within the data and all the sparsity and compressibility that you could sense within the image, the compressed sensing could be uh, very highly uh, required uh, for such type of application. And uh, also wireless sensing networks, since it actually 
don't do much for the encoding, but most of the work is uh, shifted to the decoder, while the sensor network would be like the best, uh, uh, the best um, uh, for compressed sensing in the sense of, of course, communications or cooperative uh, uh, communication, because it's also beneficial for uh, medical imaging and, and so on. So wireless sensor networks, are, they're actually known to have a, these uh, spatial and temporal correlation. So imagine you are in a, maybe the forest again, and uh, we have many sensors placed, and they are sensing temperature. Of course, the temperature from this tree wouldn't change that much from the next tree. And so we see like some kind of like overall temporal correlation. They're sensing the same physical um, uh, phenomena, and they are not far uh, from each other, which gives them uh, some uh, spatial correlation as well. And we call this intra-session correlation. So I'm having, like within my specific sensor, the fluctuation of the temperature is not really uh, noticeable. So here I can see, I can say that throughout the time, the, uh, I can notice some kind of a temporal correlation. And as I just mentioned, a uh, spatial correlation, they are close to each other, sensing the same uh, physical phenomena. And this is uh, related to what we call inter-sensor uh, correlation. Therefore, it would be interesting to exploit uh, these uh, correlations uh, uh, jointly uh, to compress. Of course, the applications uh, with sensors, like sensors there everywhere, including your phone, your laptop, and maybe your watch. So the applications include, as I mentioned, this industry 4.0, precision agriculture and animal tracking, entertainment, healthcare, and so on and so forth. Also, it is uh, important to uh, put in mind that the compressed sensing um, is not meant just for, let's say, a network layer, uh, as we are here talking about uh, communication, cooperative communication or MAC layer, but it, it actually works in, in, in different layers of the uh, OSI system. So, for example, for physical layer, it works for detection and estimation for uh, of sparse uh, physical signals like the ultra wide band, uh, wide band cognitive radio signals, uh, massive input, massive output. Also for MAC layer, it's a good candidate for erasure code and uh, for implementation of uh, multi axis channels. And uh, which, uh, like the layer, that um, is uh, important for uh, for us at the chair mostly is the network layer where compre compressed sensing could be used for data collection uh, for uh, a wireless sensor network. Could also be applied on the application letter, a layer, sorry, uh, for monitoring the network itself. For example, whenever the network performance matrices are uh, uh, sparse in some transform domain, could be a very good application. However, that is always uh, that is also always a problem. But the problem here is not because of compressed sensing. Remember, here we have a problem of the communication and the storage issue. So, with the data deluge today, we have the phenomena of what we call, phenomenon of what we call uh, like the, these data that that are floating around. We are actually they are actually called data rich. They contain a lot of data, but Mm -hmm. Put in mind, they are information poor, means they are useless. After maybe one minute, maybe this this data is no longer used, or it's actually repetitive. The temperature in this minute is the same, the next one. So we see data, but mm, information, no, there's, there's nothing. But um, I mean, um, this is uh, like sensitive into hitting uh, a big data issue. And uh, of course, now that we have these wireless sensor networks everywhere, we have this irreversible explosion of big data. We cannot take it back. Put in mind that we are actually having uh, today more data uh, circulating around 
it's larger than our uh, capabilities of storing it. So we have to do something here. And obviously, the, this thing should be comprehensive. So for example, I state the storage issue in airplanes. So there are several terabytes data per trip that are generated from sensors. Of course, a lot of sensors within um, uh, uh, airplanes and uh, sensors in the engine control. And this cannot be actually stored because it will increase the load of the flight. So it could be better if we just do some type of um, uh, kind of like easy compression and we keep this uh, compressed uh, data for later. Could be interesting for engineers uh, at the back end uh, to check the, um, like the, how to say, um, not the health of the engine, but like how the engine is doing, like checking on some uh, uh, sensors within the plane. It could be, it could be nice uh, for uh, further uh, maybe uh, reparation, as well as the example of Formula One cars. So actually between 60 to 80 gigabytes uh, data per, rent, per race are to be sent in real time for the team researchers. So you know that it's a little bit uh, sensitive. The life of the uh, driver is, is, is put in danger. If something is going wrong, this has to be transmitted past. So if we are cleverly compressing this and sending it fast to the team researchers that could um, by themselves uh, check or verify or update the software or anything uh, for the uh, Formula One uh, driver, it could be interesting. So this data could be processed at, at night as well to update the software for the next day. Uh, could be used like a right away to um, uh, fix the car if there is a problem and, and so on. So this actually push these, these issues they actually need. They push for the need for greening the big data from the data collection stage. <laughs> Sorry. And greening it um, could be seen also or, or could be tackled uh, from a compressed sensing uh, perspective. So compressed sensing could help in reducing uh, this huge amount uh, of data. And in this way, we would have less data communicated in the network, less uh, energy consumption, and so on. So compressed sensing has the ability to deal with any type of data. Luckily, it can deal with everything, sensor readings, medical imaging, and, and so on. So it, we can plug it in a way that uh, whatever data that we are harvesting, it wouldn't be uh, stored uh, as raw well as it is. It could be compressed, and then we are helping a little bit uh, this data deletion. Also, the reconstruction algorithms, they are stable, flexible, and scalable, could be used for any type of, uh, of application, and, th and this can actually uh, help in uh, widening the potential uh, use of uh, compressed sensing. Also, uh, for example, in uh, vehicular systems, uh, if I'm having a, a driverless car or, a, or a, let's say, self-driving car, uh, or even like these uh, normal cars that we are having nowadays, they have um, uh, sensor networks uh, all over, uh, all around, like uh, this surround view display in infotainment system. I'm having a uh, drive and monitoring with acoustic or haptic warning. I'm having blind spot detection uh, radar with visual, visual warning. And all this could constitute a, a wireless sensor network. Actually, uh, here you feel the potential, of course, of compressed sensing. The challenges are the large scale uh, distribution and uh, the delay sensitivity and mobility. So. We have to always put in mind that, okay, we can compress and send. It will be like a quick 
uh, small packets, yeah, but at the back end, uh, it would require a bit of time uh, for a uh, for response. So it is still like a um, challenge, uh, research challenge, to make the compressed sensing or bring it to uh, low latency applications. But nevertheless, it, 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 there, is, there is the potential. It's just that we really need to find uh, the right algorithms or, uh, or, I don't know, maybe in the future uh, with the 5G uh, systems, there, there might be a chance to make it faster. So here we see the motivation to seek new techniques for the 5G uh, vehicular systems. And why not the uh, uh, compressed sensing? And of course, um, these examples of applications in the vehicular infotainment uh, systems. So it actually could be useful for safe driving. Uh, you could receive, like, um, well, for example, uh, the road conditions could be broadcasted. And uh, of course, the transmissions are uh, compressed. Uh, there, is, there are some advanced warnings for the road or for the highway, for example, or news of large events. Um, hopefully not, but mm, there are accidents that could happen sometimes. So here it could be a, a good use uh, uh, of compressed sensing. Also object tracking for uh, driving safety, privacy protection and security, road traffic estimation. Uh, thanks to the sensors that each of the cars they have, and they keep uh, transmitting this to a uh, uh, cloud or uh, or certain edge that is uh, um, uh, like uh, interpreting this information and in reverse uh, disseminated to uh, disseminating it to uh, coming cars, etc. As well as entertainment system, yeah, for a pleasant uh, pleasant journey, there is like video streaming based on compressed sensing. Some object recognition for entertainment as well. So a lot of applications. So you could see here in this um, uh, table, the applications that we were discussing, uh, what are the traditional methods uh, that we uh, were using previously, for example, for uh, for uh, traffic estimation, it relies on complicated traffic models with very poor performance uh, of estimate error. Uh, but the method proposed with the compressed sensing, it proposes an estimation method with low cost of the overall system. Uh, for example, as well, video coding, we have raw data, uh, which is uh, immensely uh, like uh, hurting the big data issue here. We have raw data directly transmitted without any processing, but with the compressed sensing, this can achieve a capacity gain and reduce the delay with error resilience and very low complexity. So there's like some methods, applications. Uh, this is a, like a hot research topic uh, for the moment. And uh, finally, uh, the compressed sensing could be applied in this uh, wireless body area uh, network where, uh, let's say, a sick person is being uh, monitored, uh, let's say, um, um, like a, I'm having a certain diagnosis regarding my blood pressure, heart rate, uh, uh, etc. And uh, these uh, measurements, they're not sent raw, but more like compressed and they are transferred uh, to the hospital or to your personal uh, uh, doctor. And he can make a decision based on this uh, uh, like a rec reconstructed uh, values that he will have uh, uh, thanks to this, for example, healthcare big data analyzer. So he would be checking if there is a certain alert, like, oh, a high heart, uh, blood pressure or uh, uh, too many heartbeats for a very old guy, then mm, hello, we get the doctor. Okay. And uh, this is, uh, like, this part is, uh, it's like, uh, how to say, like, we have this uh, CETI. Um, 
uh, the, uh, the CU Dresden that uh, mainly focus on uh, human in the loop with uh, how to make the like a, a fast decisions for sick people and so on. So maybe those who are interested, they might uh, go check the SETI website for more details about the, the connection between the communication and the uh, medical engineering in general. So now we move to the part of distributed compressed sensing. So you heard me saying there are correlations, uh, temporal, spatial within sensor networks. And, uh, but previously the steps that we were doing is that we take each uh, signals from a specific sensor, we compress, we send for each sensor and the uh, decoder, uh, all he has to do is just to uh, reconstruct each of the signals belonging to uh, separate sensors uh, separately, that's it. Um, but here the idea of distributed compressed sensing as it's like distributed, that we are working about uh, uh, decentralized compressed sensing, we have uh, to measure separately. Of course, the sensor will keep working on its own, but we uh, uh, do distributed compressed sensing in order to be able to reconstruct this uh, jointly. This could be also beneficial to uh, make the reconstruction even faster. So a distributed sparse signal is acquired by various sensors that see different versions, as we explained uh, earlier. So, I'm sorry. So we have, um, here we have different uh, signals that are recorded uh, or uh, sensed using different sensors. And here we have a phenomenon uh, that we are uh, recording, let's say humidity. And uh, these sensors, uh, they have, uh, I mean, the characteristics of the signals amongst all these sensors, they could be having common parts. Because, I mean, they are close to each other, sensing the same thing, so logically they will have a common part, but some variation. So <clears throat> here uh, we uh, denote the sparse innovations, for example, and this is the, what we call a sparse common support for all the signals, uh, for sorry, for all the sensors, or also signals. So the correlations of the signals, they do not have the same characteristics and form, and they can actually vary according to the type of the signals or the scenarios, etc. So we will not always see uh, that our signals will have uh, a common part, some variations. We will see this in the next slide. So just put in mind that as long as we are in the same area around or measuring the same type of uh, of, uh, of signals, then there is some sh something, uh, sorry, something uh, expected to be common here. Okay, so how the process of this distributed compressed sensing is uh, performed? So take for example n uh, sensors, each of which is recording or sensing uh, some original reading x1 until xn because we have n sensors. Of course, the original signal is not expected to be sparse. Therefore, we apply this psi, uh, like a well-known transform or a, or a dictionary, of course, with a grain of salt because the dictionary doesn't uh, work with one signal. And uh, like this projection would give me a certain a sparse representation, a theta one. What I obtain, I'm going to a project on a Gaussian or a Bernoulli matrix, phi one, uh, and then I'm going to get my first measurement. And this process is performed throughout all the, all the sensor uh, readings. So everything, like all these measurements y1 until yn are sent to the decoder. Let's uh, 
pretend here we have an, we are having our sink or our decoder that I have received everything and now I'm not going to decode everything uh, on its own so here I won't have an output for each uh, block but I'm going to do this jointly thanks to this distributed compressed sensing and uh, as an output I will have my reconstructed signal so instead of running my algorithm n times uh, for n sensors I would just run it once and I'm, my output would be like the reconstructed signal let's say I mean it, it shouldn't really uh, sorry my reconstructed signal that sometimes could be a little bit corrupted but overall it's a very good estimation so um, for this distributed compressed sensing um, there have been a classification of what we call a joint sparsity model uh, researchers they found out that there are models based on the, the this specific scenario that are GSM 1, 2, and 3. So as we said, like each of these signals, uh, they can be a combination of two components. The first could be like a common component, which is present in all signals, and what we call innovation component that is unique to that specific signal. The three uh, common models and put in mind that there are more models but uh, to be honest these are the three useful ones uh, according to my experience the first one uh, uh, like uh, is concerned with the spa with the signals that have sparse common support plus innovations the second uh, sparse common support and the third is uh, concerned with the non-sparse common component plus a sparse innovation so let's see uh, how JSM1 uh, actually is, or how can we formulate it. So um, uh, the, here we have this uh, sparse common support plus innovation. We have n signals that share a common support but have different coefficients. So my signal xy and for uh, sorry xi and the i refers to the index of my sensor and it varies. Uh, in the uh, in the set 1n so I'm having it as a, a sum zc for referring to common and zi referring to innovation so here I'm having my common component uh, zc could also be written as a psi c alpha c means I am uh, having a sparse representation and um, uh, sorry, and the, the and the cardinal of my uh, of my support here is Kc. So let's say the sparsity level is Kc, and for the innovation co uh, component, my uh, sparsity level is is Ki. Uh, yeah. So uh, the practical solution, a uh, situation for such a, a, a model would be the acoustic sensors uh, of, or uh, networks, a network of sensors that are geographically close and that are simultaneously monitoring a natural uh, phenomenon. And uh, of course, uh, for the GSM models, you could still use the, uh, uh, these uh, reconstruction algorithms that we've seen in the previous uh, lecture, but there are dedicated algorithms as well, as well that work uh, well, let's say exclusively for such kind of uh, models for instance here we can have a one-step greedy algorithm as for uh, gsm2 here we have all the signals they share a common support but they actually have different coefficients so this uh, uh, this support is the same they all be projected inside uh, it makes sense, for example, if I'm having uh, uh, like uh, the sensors that I've been talking about, that they are uh, uh, monitoring uh, a physical phenomena like the temperature. Of course, like temperature from sensor one, uh, if I'm going to project it, I would use, let's say, a DCT. It is also valid, so I would be using the same um, 
the sparsifying basis of frames. So that's why uh, we have this phi, but we have different uh, uh, coefficients for it. So as a practical situation uh, for this model, we have the case where different sensors, they acquire the same signals, but they have uh, like phase shift, for example. Uh, also, we have ECG signals, MIMO communication, and for recovery algorithms, uh, we could use a trivial pursuit or a distributed compressed sensing, a simultaneous orthogonal matching pursuit. A very long name. <laughs> DCSSOMP. And finally, the JSM3, which focuses on non sparse common signal among the sensors and a sparse innovation part which is specific to each one of them. So uh, this should be C, I'm sorry for that. So here XC, and this is my uh, innovation uh, part that is uh, uh, sparse. For a practical situation, here we have a compression of uh, data, for example, the videos that are uh, where each video frame is not sparse. But if we calculate the difference between them, it could be sparse in some uh, sparsity basis. And for the recovery algorithm, we could use the common signal uh, estimation recovery or differential innovation uh, recovery.